Book Three, Chapter Two, Part One of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Three, Chapter Two A Matter of Aesthetics. Part One of Two. On the night when Anthony had left for Camp Hooker one year before, all that was left of the beautiful Gloria Gilbert, her shell, her young and lovely body, moved up the broad marble steps of the Grand Central Station, with the rhythm of the engine beating in her ears like a dream, and out onto Vanderbilt Avenue, where the huge bulk of the Biltmore overhung the street, and, down at its low gleaming entrance, sucked in the many-colored opera cloaks of gorgeously dressed girls. For a moment she paused by the taxi stand and watched them, wondering that, but a few years before she had been of their number, ever setting out for a radiant somewhere, always just about to have that ultimate passionate adventure for which the girls' cloaks were delicate and beautifully furred, for which their cheeks were painted and their hearts higher than the transitory dome of pleasure that would engulf them, coiffure, cloak and all. It was growing colder, and the men passing had flipped up the collars of their overcoats. This change was kind to her. It would have been kinder still had everything changed, weather, streets, and people, and had she been whisked away to wake in some high, fresh-scented room, alone, and statesque within and without, as in her virginal and colorful past. Inside the taxicab she wept impotent tears. That she had not been happy with Anthony for over a year mattered little. Recently his presence had been no more than what it would awaken her of that memorable June. The Anthony of late, irritable, weak, and poor, could do no less than make her irritable in turn, and bored with everything except the fact that, in a highly imaginative and eloquent youth, they had come together in an ecstatic revel of emotion. Because of this mutually vivid memory, she would have done more for Anthony than for any other human. So when she got into the taxicab she wept passionately, and wanted to call his name aloud. Miserable, lonesome as a forgotten child, she sat in the quiet apartment and wrote him a letter full of confused sentiment. I can almost look down the tracks and see you going, but without you, dearest, dearest, I can't see or hear or feel or think. Being apart, whatever has happened or will happen to us, is like begging for mercy from a storm, Anthony. It's like growing old. I want to kiss you so, in the back of your neck where your old black hair starts. Because I love you, and whatever we do or say to each other, or have done, or have said, you've got to feel how much I do, how inanimate I am when you're gone. I can't even hate the damnable presence of people, those people in the station who haven't any right to live. I can't resent them even though they're dirtying up our world, because I'm engrossed in wanting you so. If you hated me, if you were covered with sores like a leper, if you ran away with another woman or starved me or beat me, how absurd this sounds, I'd still want you, I'd still love you. I know, my darling. It's late. I have all the windows open, and the air outside is just as soft as spring, yet somehow much more young and frail than spring. Why do they make spring a young girl? Why does that illusion dance and yodel its way for three months through the world's preposterous barrenness? Spring is a lean old plow horse, with its ribs showing. It's a pile of refuse in a field, parched by the sun and rain, to an ominous cleanliness. In a few hours you'll wake up, my darling, and you'll be miserable and disgusted with life. You'll be in Delaware or Carolina or somewhere, and so unimportant. I don't believe there's anyone alive who can contemplate themselves as an impermanent institution, as a luxury or an unnecessary evil. Very few of the people who accentuate the futility of life remark the futility of themselves. Perhaps they think that, in proclaiming the evil of living, they somehow salvage their own worth from the ruin. But they don't, even you and I. Still I can see you. There's blue haze about the trees where you'll be passing, too beautiful to be predominant. 
No, the fallow squares of earth will be most frequent. They'll be along beside the track like dirty coarse brown sheets drying in the sun, alive, mechanical, abominable. Nature, slovenly old hag, has been sleeping in them with every old farmer or negro or immigrant who happened to covet her. So you see that now you've gone, I've written a letter all full of contempt and despair, and that just means that I love you, Anthony, with all there is to love in your... Gloria. When she had addressed the letter, she went to her twin bed and lay down upon it, clasping Anthony's pillow in her arms, as though by sheer force of emotion she could metamorphize it into his warm and living body. Two o'clock saw her dry-eyed, staring with steady, persistent grief into the darkness, remembering, remembering unmercifully, blaming herself for a hundred fancied unkindnesses, making a likeness of Anthony akin to some martyred and transfigured Christ. For a time she thought of him as he, in his more sentimental moments, probably thought of himself. At five she was still awake. A mysterious grinding noise that went on every morning across the area way told her the hour. She heard an alarm clock ring, and saw a light make a yellow square on an illusory blank wall opposite. With the half-formed resolution of following him south immediately, her sorrow grew remote and unreal, and moved off from her as the dark moved westward. She fell asleep. When she awoke, the sight of the empty bed beside her brought a renewal of misery, dispelled shortly, however, by the inevitable callousness of the bright morning. Though she was not conscious of it, there was relief in eating breakfast without Anthony's tired and worried face opposite her. Now that she was alone, she lost all desire to complain about the food. She would change her breakfasts, she thought, have a lemonade and a tomato sandwich instead of the sempiternal bacon and eggs and toast. Nonetheless, at noon, when she had called up several of her acquaintances, including the Marshal Muriel, and found each one engaged for lunch, she gave way to a quiet pity for herself and her loneliness. Curled on the bed, with pencil and paper, she wrote Anthony another letter. Late in the afternoon arrived a special delivery, mailed from some small New Jersey town, and the familiarity of the phrasing, the almost audible undertone of worry and discontent, were so familiar that they comforted her. Who knew? Perhaps army discipline would harden Anthony and accustom him to the idea of work. She had immutable faith that the war would be over before he was called upon to fight, and meanwhile the suit would be won, and they could begin again, this time on a different basis. The first thing different would be that she would have a child. It was unbearable that she should be so utterly alone. It was a week before she could stay in the apartment, with the probability of remaining dry-eyed. There seemed little in the city that was amusing. Muriel had been shifted to a hospital in New Jersey, from which she took a metropolitan holiday only every other week, and with this defection Gloria grew to realize how few were the friends she had made in all these years of New York. The men she knew were in the army. Men she knew? She had conceded vaguely to herself that all the men who had ever been in love with her were her friends. Each one of them had, at a certain considerable time, professed to value her favor above anything in life. But now, where were they? At least two were dead. Half a dozen or more were married. The rest scattered from France to the Philippines. She wondered whether any of them thought of her, and how often, and in what respect. Most of them must still picture the little girl of seventeen or so, the adolescent siren of nine years before. The girls, too, were gone far afield. She had never been popular in school. She had been too beautiful, too lazy, not sufficiently conscious of being a farm-over girl and a future wife and mother, in perpetual capital letters. And girls who had never been kissed hinted, with shocked expressions on their plain, but not particularly wholesome faces, that Gloria had. Then these girls had gone east or west or south, married, and become people, prophesying, if they prophesied about Gloria, that she would come to a bad end, not knowing that no endings were bad, and that they, like her, were by no means the mistresses of their destinies. 
Gloria told over to herself the people who had visited them in the gray house at Marietta. It had seemed at the time that they were always having company. She had indulged in an unspoken conviction that each guest was ever afterwards slightly indebted to her. They owed her a sort of moral ten dollars apiece, and, should she ever be in need, she might, so to speak, borrow from them this visionary currency. But they were gone, scattered like chaff, mysteriously and subtly vanished in essence or in fact. By Christmas, Gloria's conviction that she should join Anthony had returned, no longer as a sudden emotion but as a recurrent need. She decided to write to him word of her coming, but postponed the announcement upon the advice of Mr. Haight, who expected almost weekly that the case was coming up for trial. One day, early in January, as she was walking on Fifth Avenue, bright now with uniforms and hung with the flags of the virtuous nations, she met Rachel Barnes, whom she had not seen for nearly a year. Even Rachel, whom she had grown to dislike, was a relief from ennui, and together they went to the Ritz for tea. After a second cocktail they became enthusiastic. They liked each other. They talked about their husbands. Rachel, in that tone of public vainglory with private reservations in which wives are wont to speak. Rodman's abroad in the quartermaster corps. He's a captain. He was bound he would go, and he didn't think he could get into anything else. Anthony's in the infantry. The words in their relation to the cocktail gave Gloria a sort of glow. With each sip she approached a warm and comforting patriotism. "'By the way,' said Rachel, half an hour later, as they were leaving, "'can't you come up to dinner tomorrow night? I'm having two awfully sweet officers who are just going overseas. I think we ought to do all we can to make it attractive for them.' Gloria accepted gladly. She took down the address, recognizing by its number a fashionable apartment building on Park Avenue. "'It's been awfully good to have seen you, Rachel.' It's been wonderful. I've wanted to. With these three sentences, a certain night in Marietta two summers before, when Anthony and Rachel had been unnecessarily attentive to each other, was forgiven. Gloria forgave Rachel. Rachel forgave Gloria. Also, it was forgiven that Rachel had been witness to the greatest disaster in the lives of Mr. and Mrs. Anthony Patch. Compromising with events, time moves along. THE WILES OF CAPTAIN COLLINS The two officers were captains of the popular craft, machine gunnery. At dinner they referred to themselves with conscious boredom as members of the Suicide Club. In those days every recondite branch of the service referred to itself as the Suicide Club. One of the captains, Rachel's captain, Gloria observed, was a tall, horsey man of thirty, with a pleasant mustache and ugly teeth. The other, Captain Collins, was chubby, pink-faced, pink-faced, and inclined to laugh with abandon every time he caught Gloria's eye. He took an immediate fancy to her, and throughout dinner showered her with inane compliments. With her second glass of champagne, Gloria decided that, for the first time in months, she was thoroughly enjoying herself. After dinner it was suggested that they all go somewhere and dance. The two officers supplied themselves with bottles of liquor from Rachel's sideboard, a law forbade service to the military, and so equipped they went through innumerable foxtrots in several glittering caravanseries along Broadway, faithfully alternating partners, while Gloria became more and more uproarious and more and more amusing to the pink-faced captain, who seldom bothered to remove his genial smile at all. At eleven o'clock, to her great surprise, she was in the minority for staying out. The others wanted to return to Rachel's apartment, to get some more liquor, they said. Gloria argued persistently that Captain Collins's flask was half full. She had just seen it. Then, catching Rachel's eye, she received an unmistakable wink. She deduced, confusedly, that her hostess wanted to get rid of the officers and assented to being bundled into a taxicab outside. Captain Wolfe sat on the left with Rachel on his knees. Captain Collins sat in the middle, and as he settled himself he slipped his arm about Gloria's shoulders. It rested there lifelessly for a moment and then tightened like a vise. He leaned over her. You're awfully pretty. 
he whispered. "'Thank you kindly, sir.' She was neither pleased nor annoyed. Before Anthony came, so many arms had done likewise that it had become little more than a gesture, sentimental but without significance. Up in Rachel's long front room a low fire and two lamps shaded with orange silk gave all the light, so that the corners were full of deep and somnolent shadows. The hostess, moving about in a dark-figured gown of loose chiffon, seemed to accentuate the already sensuous atmosphere. For a while they were all four together, tasting the sandwiches that waited on the tea-table. Then Gloria found herself alone with Captain Collins on the fireside lounge. Rachel and Captain Wolfe had withdrawn to the other side of the room, where they were conversing in subdued voices. "'I wish you weren't married,' said Collins, his face a ludicrous travesty of, in all seriousness. "'Why?' She held out her glass to be filled with a highball. "'Don't drink any more,' he urged her, frowning. "'Why not? You'd be nicer if you didn't.' Gloria caught suddenly the intended suggestion of the remark, the atmosphere he was attempting to create. She wanted to laugh, yet she realized that there was nothing to laugh at. She had been enjoying the evening, and she had no desire to go home. At the same time, it hurt her pride to be flirted with, on just that level. "'Pour me another drink,' she insisted. "'Please. Oh, don't be ridiculous,' she cried in exasperation. "'Very well,' he yielded with ill grace. Then his arm was about her again, and again she made no protest. But when his pink cheek came close, she leaned away. "'You're awfully sweet,' he said with an aimless air. She began to sing softly, wishing now that he would take down his arm. Suddenly her eye fell on an intimate scene across the room. Rachel and Captain Wolfe were engrossed in a long kiss. Gloria shivered slightly. She knew not why. Pink Face approached again. "'You shouldn't look at them,' he whispered. Almost immediately his other arm was around her. His breath was on her cheek. Again absurdity triumphed over disgust and her laugh was a weapon that needed no edge of words. "'Oh, I thought you were a sport,' he was saying. "'What's a sport?' "'Why, a person that likes to—to—to to enjoy life. "'Is kissing you generally considered a joyful affair?' They were interrupted as Rachel and Captain Wolfe appeared suddenly before them. "'It's late, Gloria,' said Rachel. She was flushed and her hair was disheveled. "'You'd better stay here all night.' For an instant Gloria thought the officers were being dismissed. Then she understood, and, understanding, got to her feet as casually as she was able. Uncomprehendingly, Rachel continued, "'You can have the room just off this one. I can lend you everything you need.' Collins's eyes implored her like a dog's. Captain Wolfe's arm had settled familiarly around Rachel's waist. They were waiting. But the lure of promiscuity, colorful, various, labyrinthine, and ever a little odorous and stale, had no call or promise for Gloria. Had she so desired, she would have remained without hesitation, without regret. As it was, she could face coolly the six hostile and offended eyes that followed her out into the hall with forced politeness and hollow words. He wasn't even sport enough to try to take me home, she thought in the taxi, and then with a quick surge of resentment, how utterly common! Gallantry. In February she had an experience of quite a different sort. Tudor Baird, an ancient flame, a young man whom at one time she had fully intended to marry, came to New York by way of the Aviation Corps and called upon her. They went several times to the theatre, and within a week, to her great enjoyment, he was as much in love with her as ever. Quite deliberately she brought it about, realizing too late that she had done a mischief. He reached the point of sitting with her in miserable silence whenever they went out together. A scroll and keys man at Yale, he possessed the correct reticences of a good egg, the correct notions of chivalry and noblesse oblige, and, of course, but unfortunately, the correct biases and the correct lack of ideas, all those traits which Anthony had taught her to despise, but which, nevertheless, she rather admired. Unlike the majority of his type, she found that he was not a bore. He was handsome, 
witty in a light way, and when she was with him she felt that because of some quality he possessed, call it stupidity, loyalty, sentimentality, or something not quite as definite as any of the three, he would have done anything in his power to please her. He told her this, among other things, very correctly, and with a ponderous manliness that masked a real suffering. Loving him not at all, she grew sorry for him, and kissed him sentimentally one night because he was so charming, a relic of a vanishing generation which lived a priggish and graceful illusion, and was being replaced by less gallant fools. Afterward she was glad she had kissed him, for next day when his plane fell fifteen hundred feet at Mineola, a piece of a gasoline engine smashed through his heart. Gloria Alone When Mr. Haight told her that the trial would not take place until autumn, she decided that, without telling Anthony, she would go into the movies. When he saw her, successful, both histrionically and financially, when he saw that she could have her will of Joseph Blockman, yielding nothing in return, he would lose his silly prejudices. She lay awake half one night, planning her career and enjoying her successes in anticipation, and the next morning she called up films par excellence. Mr. Blockman was in Europe. But the idea had gripped her so strongly this time that she decided to go the rounds of the moving picture employment agencies. As had so often been the case, her sense of smell worked against her good intentions. The employment agency smelt as though it had been dead a very long time. She waited five minutes, inspecting her unprepossessing competitors. Then she walked briskly out into the farthest recesses of Central Park and remained so long that she caught a cold. She was trying to air the employment agency out of her walking suit. In the spring, she began to gather from Anthony's letters, not from any one in particular, but from their cumulative effect, that he did not want her to come south. Curiously repeated excuses that seemed to haunt him by their very insufficiency occurred with Freudian regularity. He set them down in each letter as though he feared he had forgotten them the last time, as though it were desperately necessary to impress her with them and the delusions of his letters with affectionate diminutives began to be mechanical and unspontaneous, almost as though, having completed the letter, he had looked it over and literally stuck them in, like epigrams in an Oscar Wilde play. She jumped to the solution, rejected it, was angry and depressed by turns. Finally she shut her mind to it proudly, and allowed an increasing coolness to creep into her end of the correspondence. Of late she had found a good deal to occupy her attention. Several aviators, whom she had met through Tudor Baird, came into New York to see her, and two other ancient bows turned up, stationed at Camp Dix. As these men were ordered overseas, they, so to speak, handed her down to their friends. But after another rather disagreeable experience with a potential Captain Collins, she made it plain that when anyone was introduced to her, he should be under no misapprehension as to her status and personal intentions. When summer came, she learned, like Anthony, to watch the officer's casualty list, taking a sort of melancholy pleasure in hearing of the death of someone with whom she had once danced a German, and in identifying by name the younger brothers of former suitors, thinking, as the drive toward Paris progressed, that here, at length, went the world, to inevitable and well-merited destruction. She was twenty-seven. Her birthday fled by, scarcely noticed. Years before, it had frightened her when she became twenty, to some extent when she reached twenty-six. But now she looked in the glass with calm self-approval, seeing the British freshness of her complexion, and her figure boyish and slim as of old. She tried not to think of Anthony. It was as though she were writing to a stranger, she told her friends that he had been made a corporal, and was annoyed when they were politely unimpressed. One night she wept because she was sorry for him. Had he been even slightly responsive, she would have gone to him without hesitation on the first train. Whatever he was doing, he needed to be taken care of spiritually, and she felt that now she would be able to do even that. Recently, without his continual drain on her moral strength, she found herself wonderfully revived. Before he left, she had been inclined through sheer association to brood on her wasted opportunities. Now she returned to her normal state of mind, strong, 
disdainful, existing each day for each day's worth. She bought a doll and dressed it. One week she wept over Ethan Frome. The next she reveled in some novels of Galsworthy's, whom she liked for his power of recreating, by spring in darkness, that illusion of young romantic love to which women look forever forward and forever back. In October Anthony's letters multiplied, became almost frantic, then suddenly ceased. For a worried month it needed all her powers of control to refrain from leaving immediately for Mississippi. Then a telegram told her that he had been in the hospital and that she could expect him in New York within ten days. Like a figure in a dream he came back into her life, across the ballroom, on that November evening. And all through the long hours that held familiar gladness, she took him close to her breast, nursing an illusion of happiness and security she had not thought that she would know again. Discomfiture of the Generals After a week, Anthony's regiment went back to the Mississippi camp to be discharged. The officers shut themselves up in the compartments on the Pullman cars and drank the whiskey they had bought in New York. And in the coaches, the soldiers got as drunk as possible also, and pretended that, whenever the train stopped at a village, that they were just returned from France, where they had practically put an end to the German army. As they all wore overseas caps, and claimed that they had not had time to have their gold service stripes sewed on, the yokelry of the seaboard were much impressed and asked them how they liked the trenches, to which they replied, Oh boy, with great smacking of tongues and shaking of heads. Someone took a piece of chalk and scrawled on the side of the train, We won the war, now we're going home. And the officers laughed and let it stay. They were all getting what swagger they could out of this ignominious return. As they rumbled on toward camp, Anthony was uneasy lest he should find Dot awaiting him patiently at the station. To his relief, he neither saw nor heard anything of her, and thinking that, were she still in town, she would certainly attempt to communicate with him, he concluded that she had gone, whither he neither knew nor cared. He wanted only to return to Gloria, Gloria reborn and wonderfully alive. When eventually he was discharged, he left his company on the rear of a great truck, with a crowd who had given tolerant, almost sentimental cheers for their officers, especially for Captain Dunning. The captain, on his part, had addressed them with tears in his eyes as to the pleasure, etc., and the work, etc., and time not wasted, etc., and duty, etc. It was very dull and human. Having given ear to it, Anthony, whose mind was freshened by his week in New York, renewed his deep loathing for the military profession and all it connoted. In their childish hearts, Two out of every three professional officers considered that wars were made for armies and not armies for wars. He rejoiced to see general and field officers riding desolately about the barren camp, deprived of their commands. He rejoiced to hear the men in his company laugh scornfully at the inducements tendered them to remain in the army. They were to attend schools. He knew what these schools were. Two days later, he was with Gloria in New York. Another Winter Late one February afternoon, Anthony came into the apartment, and, groping through the little hall, pitch dark in the winter dust, found Gloria sitting by the window. She turned as he came in. "'What did Mr. Haight have to say?' she asked, listlessly. "'Nothing,' he answered. "'Usual thing. Next month, perhaps.' She looked at him closely, her ear attuned to his voice, caught the slightest thickness in the disyllable. "'You've been drinking,' she remarked dispassionately. "'Couple glasses?' "'Oh.' He yawned in the armchair, and there was a moment's silence between them. Then she demanded suddenly, "'Did you go to Mr. Haight? Tell me the truth.' "'No,' he smiled weakly. "'As a matter of fact, I didn't have time. I thought you didn't go. He sent for you. I don't give a damn.' I'm sick of waiting around his office. You'd think he was doing me a favor. He glanced at Gloria as though expecting moral support, but she had turned back to her contemplation of the dubious and unprepossessing out of doors. I feel rather weary of life today, he offered tentatively. Still she was silent. I met a fellow and we talked in the Biltmore Bar. 
The dusk had suddenly deepened, but neither of them made any move to turn on the lights. Lost in heaven knew what contemplation, they sat there until a flurry of snow drew a languid sigh from Gloria. "'What have you been doing?' he asked, finding the silence oppressive. "'Reading a magazine, all full of idiotic articles by prosperous authors about how terrible it is for poor people to buy silk shirts. And while I was reading it I could think of nothing else except how I wanted a grey squirrel coat, and how we can't afford one.' "'Yes, we can. Oh, no. Oh, yes. If you want a fur coat, you can have one." Her voice coming through the dark held an implication of scorn. "'You mean we can sell another bond?' "'If necessary. I don't want you to go without things. We have spent a lot, though, since I've been back.' "'Oh, shut up!' she said in irritation. "'Why? Because I'm sick and tired of hearing you talk about what we've spent or what we've done. You came back two months ago and we've been on some sort of a party practically every night since. We've both wanted to go out, and we've gone. Well, you haven't heard me complain, have you? But all you do is whine, whine, whine. I don't care any more what we do or what becomes of us, and at least I'm consistent. But I will not tolerate your complaining and calamity howling. You're not very pleasant yourself sometimes, you know. I'm under no obligations to be. You're not making any attempt to make things different. But I am. Huh, seems to me I've heard that before. This morning you weren't going to touch another thing to drink until you'd gotten a position, and you didn't even have the spunk to go to Mr. Haight when he sent for you about the suit. Anthony got to his feet and switched on the lights. See here, he cried, blinking. I'm getting sick of that sharp tongue of yours. Well, what are you going to do about it? Do you think I'm particularly happy? He continued, ignoring her question. Do you think I don't know we're not living as we ought to?" In an instant Gloria stood trembling beside him. "'I won't stand it!' she burst out. "'I won't be lectured to. You and your suffering. You're just a pitiful weakling and you always have been.' They faced one another, idiotically, each of them unable to impress the other, each of them tremendously, achingly bored. Then she went into the bedroom and shut the door behind her. His return had brought into the foreground all their pre-bellum exasperations. Prices had risen alarmingly, and in perverse ratio their income had shrunk to a little over half its original size. There had been the large retainer's fee to Mr. Haight. There were stocks bought at one hundred, now down to thirty and forty, and other investments that were not paying at all. During the previous spring, Gloria had been given the alternative of leaving the apartment or signing a year's lease at two hundred and twenty-five a month. She had signed it. Inevitably, as the necessity for economy had increased, they found themselves, as a pair, quite unable to save. The old policy of prevarication was resorted to. Weary of their incapabilities, they chattered of what they would do, oh, tomorrow, of how they would stop going to parties, and of how Anthony would go to work. But when dark came down, Gloria, accustomed to an engagement every night, would feel the ancient restlessness creeping over her. She would stand in the doorway of the bedroom, chewing furiously at her fingers, and sometimes meeting Anthony's eyes as he glanced up from his book. Then the telephone, and her nerves would relax. She would answer it with ill-concealed eagerness. Someone was coming up, for just a few minutes, and, oh, the weariness of pretense, the appearance of the wine-table, the revival of their jaded spirits, and the awakening, like the midpoint of a sleepless night in which they moved. As the winter passed with the march of the returning troops along Fifth Avenue, they became more and more aware that, since Anthony's return, their relations had entirely changed. After that reflowering of tenderness and passion, each of them had returned into some solitary dream unshared by the other and what endearments passed between them passed, it seemed, from empty heart to empty heart, echoing hollowly the departure of what they knew at last was gone. Anthony had again made the rounds of the metropolitan newspapers, and had again been refused encouragement by a motley of office boys, telephone girls, and city editors. The word was, we're keeping any vacancies open for our own men who are still in France. Then, late in March, his eye fell on an advertisement in the morning paper, 
and in consequence he found at last the semblance of an occupation. "'You can sell. Why not earn while you learn? Our salesmen make fifty to two hundred dollars weekly.' There followed an address on Madison Avenue and instructions to appear at one o'clock that afternoon. Gloria, glancing over his shoulder after one of their usual late breakfasts, saw him regarding it idly. "'Why don't you try it?' she suggested. "'Oh, it's one of those crazy schemes.' "'It might not be. At least it'd be experience.' At her urging he went at one o'clock to the appointed address, where he found himself one of a dense miscellany of men waiting in front of the door. They ranged from a messenger boy, evidently misusing his company's time, to an immemorial individual with a gnarled body and a gnarled cane. Some of the men were seedy, with sunken cheeks and puffy pink eyes, others were young, possibly still in high school. After a jostled fifteen minutes, during which they all eyed one another with apathetic suspicion, there appeared a smart young shepherd clad in a waistline suit, and wearing the manner of an assistant rector who herded them upstairs into a large room, which resembled a schoolroom and contained innumerable desks. Here the prospective salesman sat down, and again waited. After an interval, a platform at the end of the hall was clouded with half a dozen sober but sprightly men, who, with one exception, took seats in a semicircle facing the audience. The exception was the man who seemed the soberest, the most sprightly and the youngest of the lot, and who advanced to the front of the platform. The audience scrutinized him hopefully. He was rather small and rather pretty, with the commercial rather than the thespian sort of prettiness. He had straight, blond, bushy brows, and eyes that were almost preposterously honest, and as he reached the edge of his rostrum he seemed to throw these eyes out into the audience, simultaneously extending his arm with two fingers outstretched. Then, while he rocked himself to a state of balance, an expectant silence settled over the hall. With perfect assurance the young man had taken his listeners in hand, and his words, when they came, were steady and confident and of the school of straight from the shoulder. Men, he began, and paused. The word died with a prolonged echo at the end of the hall. The faces regarding him, hopefully, cynically, wearily, were alike arrested and grossed. Six hundred eyes were turned slightly upward, with an even graceless flow that reminded Anthony of the rolling of bowling balls. He launched himself into the sea of exposition. This bright and sunny morning you picked up your favorite newspaper and you found an advertisement which made the plain, unadorned statement that you could sell. That was all it said. It didn't say what. It didn't say how. It didn't say why. It just made one single, solitary assertion that you and you and you, business of pointing, could sell. Now, my job isn't to make a success of you because every man is born a success. He makes himself a failure. It's not to teach you how to talk, because each man is a natural orator and only makes himself a clam. My business is to tell you one thing in a way that will make you know it. It's to tell you that you and you and you have the heritage of money and prosperity waiting for you to come and claim it. At this point an Irishman of Saturnine appearance rose from his desk near the rear of the hall and went out. That man thinks he'll go look for it in the beer parlor around the corner. Laughter. He won't find it there. Once upon a time I looked for it there myself. Laughter. But that was before I did what every one of you men, no matter how young or how old, how poor or how rich, a faint ripple of satirical laughter, can do. It was before I found myself. Now I wonder if any of you men know what a heart talk is. A Heart Talk is a little book in which I started, about five years ago, to write down what I had discovered were the principal reasons for a man's failure and the principal reasons for a man's success, from John D. Rockefeller back to John D. Napoleon. Laughter. And before that, back in the days when Abel sold his birthright for a mess of pottage. There are now one hundred of these Heart Talks. Those of you who are sincere who are interested in our proposition, above all, who are dissatisfied with the way things are breaking for you at present, will be handed one to take home with you as you go out yonder door this afternoon. 
Now, in my own pocket, I have four letters just received concerning heart talks. These letters have names signed to them that are familiar in every household in the USA. Listen to this one from Detroit. Dear Mr. Carlton, I want to order 3,000 more copies of Heart Talks for distribution among my salesmen. They have done more for getting work out of the men than any bonus proposition ever considered. I read them myself constantly, and I desire to heartily congratulate you on getting at the roots of the biggest problem that faces our generation today, the problem of salesmanship. The rock bottom on which the country is founded is the problem of salesmanship. With many felicitations, I am, yours very cordially, Henry W. Terrell. He brought the name out in three long, booming triumphancies, pausing for it to produce its magical effect. Then he read two more letters, one from a manufacturer of vacuum cleaners, and one from the president of the great Northern Doily Company. And now, he continued, I'm going to tell you in a few words what the proposition is that's going to make those of you who go into it in the right spirit. Simply put, it's this. Heart Talks have been incorporated as a company. We're going to put these little pamphlets into the hands of every big business organization, every salesman, and every man who knows, I don't say thinks, I say knows, that he can sell. We are offering some of the stock of the Heart Talks concern upon the market, and in order that the distribution may be as wide as possible, and in order also that we can furnish a living, concrete, flesh and blood example of what salesmanship is, or rather what it may be, we're going to give those of you who are the real thing a chance to sell that stock. Now, I don't care what you've tried to sell before or how you've tried to sell it. It don't matter to me how old you are or how young you are. I only want to know two things. First, do you want success? And second, will you work for it? My name is Sammy Carlton. Not Mr. Carlton, but just plain Sammy. I'm a regular no-nonsense man with no fancy frills about me. I want you to call me Sammy. Now, this is all I'm going to say to you today. Tomorrow, I want those of you who have thought it over and have read the copy of Heart Talks, which will be given to you at the door, to come back to this same room at this same time, then we'll go into the proposition further, and I'll explain to you what I found the principles of success to be. I'm going to make you feel that you and you and you can sell. Mr. Carlton's voice echoed for a moment through the hall, and then died away. To the stamping of many feet, Anthony was pushed and jostled with the crowd out of the room. End of Book 3, Chapter 2, Part 1 of 2